Hello, you're on the road less traveled with Gary L. and Gigi's Boo on RealLibertyMedia.com and RLM Radio. Hi to everyone out there. Thanks for joining us. We're happy to be here. Gigi's Boo has just discovered that her keyboard went south, so she's unable. Real quick. I mean, yeah. I was typing with it, and it just went real quick. Yeah. It so just, don't know what happened. Yeah, it may may have to reboot the system after the show or something. I was thinking like that's that. what we're going to have to do. I'm going to have to reboot, but yeah. we didn't want to do that and everything. Oh, no, it was too late. So, so. It was too late. But hi, everybody. Yeah. Hello, everyone. What's everyone up to? We have a, a kind of a very a variegated, as I guess you'd say, show tonight. And I want to say uh, hello to everyone in the chat room to start with. Seems like a a pretty sizable crew in here. What do you think, Gigi's boo? Looks like our the whole gang's here. Yeah, it looks like a and a whole bunch of indicators that maybe they're actually a lot of active people here, and that's a good thing. And we'll hit on the chat room people that are <clears throat> showing as indicated as being active recently. Of course, Grimner is the chief cook and bottle washer of RealLibertyMedia.com and RLM Radio. He's the guy that keeps this thing going. Have Free Enslaved, and we have Java Doctor, Wanna Taco, Trust No One, Beetle, and Behind a Woodshed, and Frumpy. There are probably others listening, but they haven't said much lately, so their indicator's not there. There are a whole lot of other people logged into the chat room, and if you're not one of them, then you're probably missing out on a good deal of what's going on here. A whole body of knowledge that just exists in the the heads of these folks just in the heads of these folks and how are you going to get it unless you're in the chat room and participate in some manner unless of course you'd rather suck on a tide pod and that seems to be the going thing now and good luck with that but tonight we have static no no i don't hear my, it on my end i don't know i don't hear any i don't hear i don't hear any static but well, hopefully hopefully it's not a problem but at any rate we're, we're using a headset tonight just going to try that out for a change and see how that works. And uh, tonight's show, we're going to hit on a few things. Gigi's Boo's come up with a very interesting, very interesting storyline. I think is, we'll discuss this. Hey, Free, how you doing? Free and we're going to talk a little bit. Oh, Gigi's Boo is going to lead this uh, kidnapping of John Paul Getty. I guess, what, the third? Something. The third, yeah. yeah. John Paul Getty the third. Some of you may remember that from back in the seventies. Very interesting story. There are some indicators wrapped up into this, and one of the things that's important we like to talk about being prepared and looking to the future and possibly creating some remedies for ourselves as as we meet whatever comes over the horizon. But one of the things about being prepared is that. You have to understand your enemy. That's part of the intelligence cycle. You know, intelligence is very important because that's what operations are built on, theoretically anyway. So if, if you have no intelligence, you're going into something blindly, and that's usually a recipe for disaster. Oh, okay, thanks, Frumpy. Okay, no, he didn't hear any static. We like to look through the intelligence stuff, and, and this whole story about the John Paul Getty thing is, is somewhat instructive in that manner about you know, who you might consider to be the enemy. Also, Gigi's Boots come across something interesting about red-headed people having uh, weird superpowers. No, before we do that, wasn't this John Paul Getty guy red-headed? Yes. Ah, interesting. Okay, and I'm and I'm going to talk a little bit about a different kind of harvesting. We'd like to talk about planting and growing and harvesting, but we're going to talk a little bit about a different sort of harvesting. And as time permits, we'll look a little bit into the history of population control and genocide of all popular topics that people enjoy hearing about. But before we do all that, I want to point out something that came up most recently. There's a website called Freedoms Network, freedomsnetwork.com. It is one of those networks, uh, and in response to the controlled social media that is so popular in the news today, and when we talk about remedies, this is one of the remedies. This, this is a private website. 
you have to join you know you have to join a website and then you can share things it's it's very much a social media platform kind of in the mold of like facebook and some of the others but in this case you're not going to get censored you can post as you like here at freedomsnetwork.com and they actually are kind of in need of some uh money input to freedomsnetwork.com because you have to pay the bills every every year or you're not around anymore and it is user maintained or member maintained i guess you'd say at last count i think there were close to 300 members this website hasn't been around very long and as it turns out the annual fees associated with it are somewhere around a 300 350 dollar range so how that equates is you're looking at about a dollar a piece for a year, a dollar a year, if you want to support the good works at freedomsnetwork.com. So I would enjoy it if you would consider joining up. A, at, what's they that? got a PayPal too, don't they? Tell them about the PayPal. Yeah, it, it's real easy. You don't have to be a member to join or to support the network but why why not be a member you know it's, it's pretty simple you just create a create a a user id and password and all that good stuff and you can come in and share the wealth at freedomsnetwork.com and in the upper left hand corner of their front page is a paypal link that you know like i said a dollar if all the members give a dollar you're pretty much going to pay the bills for a year so something to keep in mind as you go along. Uh, keep freedom free. Yeah. And, you know, people fuss about Facebook. <laughs> so, well, there are alternatives to Facebook, and Freedom's Network is just one of those. So highly recommend you take a look at it if, if you are so inclined. And speaking also on <laughs> about Facebook, over on Facebook, we, were ta we talked about 5G a couple of times. There are about four or five different public groups over on Facebook that are addressing the issue of 5G. And this is really a pretty important issue, as if you paid attention at all to any of the shows, and not just ours, but some of the others as well. And some of these public groups have gotten rather large. It's just this one particular Stop 5G public group's only been around for probably a month, and it has 7,132 members. So it is a an issue that is getting people's attention, and there are about four other sites also, just on Facebook. And so you can see that there is some concern about this 5G business, as, and if you're not paying attention to it, you probably need to probably need to take a look at that and look at some of the research and as we've talked about and I'm very convinced that it has very harmful effects and science back in the 60s 500 scientific reports dating back to the 60s of the effect of super high frequency so if anybody tries to sell you the line that well we don't know if it's hazardous or not well they're lying to you whether they know it or not and I suspect they do know it depending on where they're situated they're lying to you because it's been known. Anyway, it's enough on that. Well, Gigi's Boo, you have what I think is a, a, a amazing, amazing set of stories to talk about. So why don't we take off with that? Okay. First of all, I want to apologize that I can't type in the chat room. I don't know what happened to the keyboard. Something has. The lights are on. It's just not working. And secondly, if I mute a little bit, I've got a little tickle in my throat. So y'all will hear me go silent just for a minute, but I'll be right back. My mother told me about this particular story, and we were talking about something we had seen on the History International, where you can go and get really good documentaries on things that were historical. If you hear some chattering in the background, that's my little sister talking. But anyway, I was looking at the men who made America. J. Paul Gettys came along after the big tycoons. But he worked extremely, extremely hard, founded the Getty Oil Company in 1940, and became extremely wealthy. But like I said, he worked very hard for his money, and he even learned Arabic in order to cement his status in the Middle East. Despite his vast amounts of wealth, he was a really frugal man. 
He had all the money in the world to spend it on anything he wanted to, but he was very particular about how it was distributed among his children and grandchildren. And a lot of people called him cold and hard. He really might have been, but I also think that he was the big, he was way ahead of his time because he didn't allow his children and his grandchildren to have the entitlement. And you will see this as I tell the story. His fifth wife, Teddy Getty Gaston, said that he was a miser, very, very much so. And she had written a book in 2013. The family got upset with her because they didn't want it out that he was such a miser. But through the years, it did come out. But he got extremely upset with her because she thought she was spending too much money on medical treatments for their six-year-old son, Timmy, who had a brain tumor and was blind. When Timmy passed away six years later in 1958, Mr. Geddes did not attend the funeral. Now, that kind of lays the groundwork of why he would not pay the kidnapping ransom, because I think we can put this question up as, was money more important than blood? Now, his father, John Paul Eugene Getty Jr., had four sons with his wife, Gail Harris. Their son, Paul, the one that was kidnapped, was born in 1956, and the couple divorced when he was eight. Eugene Geddes relocated to Rome and married a Dutch actress named Talithea Pohl, and the pair became addicted to drugs. Pohl overdosed on heroin in 1972, and the police believe that John Paul Getty Jr. was partially responsible for his wife's death, but he was never charged for the crime. Now, John Paul Getty III, when he was 16, he was living in Rome near his father, who was in charge of the family's Italian part of the business, Getty's Oil Italiana. This 16-year-old lived on his own after he had gotten expelled from a private school, and he was enjoying life as a carefree teenager with no responsibilities. He partied at clubs, and he participated in po political demonstrations. He made money by appearing as extras in film, selling jewelry and paintings. Now, when he was 16 years old, he was kidnapped. And on the night of his kidnapping, it was reported that he was hanging out at the Pisa Novana with a Belgian go-go dancer on July the 10th of 1973 when he totally vanished. No sight from him, anything. The Italian mafia grabbed him, placed him in the back of a van, and drove 300 miles south to the capital of Calabria which is surrounded by mountains. The captors contacted Paul's family and asked for $17 million in ransom. Now, Paul's family thought he made up the kidnapping story to get money for himself. Even though the kidnappings were not uncommon in Italy at that time, there was some doubt at first that Paul had indeed been kidnapped. People believed he made it up in order to get money from his grandfather, who had cut off his son, Paul was even known to joke about faking a kidnapping. As a result, the police and Paul's friends didn't take him seriously. But Paul wrote a letter to his mother pleading for help. And it was published by Time in July 1973. And it went something like this. Dear Mother, I have fallen into the hands of kidnappers. Don't let me be killed. Make sure that the police do not interfere. You must absolutely not take this as a joke. Don't give publicity to my kidnapping. Naturally, the family went to the grandfather. But the grandfather, who we already know, was notoriously tight with his money. And even though he's the richest man in the world, he still didn't like to spend his money. He was so cheap, they said he set up a payphone at his London home for guests. He didn't want him to use his phone. His grandfather had stopped supporting his son, J. Paul Geddes Jr., 
and his daughter-in-law, Gail Harris. So Paul's parents were unable to pay the ransom. They pleaded with the family patriarch for help, but he didn't want to pay the kidnappers because he feared it would set a precedent by causing others to follow suit and put his other family members in danger. He told the media, if I pay one penny now, I'll have 14 kidnapped grandchildren. Paul's mother was so mad with her former father-in-law that she shamed him publicly in order to get him to pay up. After about four months, the kidnappers got restless, and in November of 1973, they sent a package to a Roman newspaper with gruesome contents, a lock of Paul's red hair, and a severed ear, and they wrote, This is Paul's first ear. If within 10 days the family still believes that this is a joke, mounted by him, then the other ear will arrive. In other words, he will arrive in little bits. The kidnappers asked for $3.2 million, and the family patriarch negotiated it down to $2.89 million. J. Paul Getty, the grandfather, paid $2.2 million. Now get a load of this, what I'm getting ready to say, which was tax deductible for him. While his son was responsible for the remaining amount, which he borrowed from his father at 4% interest. So even in a family circumstance that would run us all crazy, Mr. Getty was still making money. Okay, Paul was released from captivity. He was malnourished and kind of feeble. And that was following five months of being captive. He was released on December 15th, 73. They said he spent hours trying to flag down a passing motorist in the rain on the Italian road when he was eventually picked up by a truck driver. Paul explained that he had been kidnapped and needed to call his mother. When the police arrived, he identified himself and revealed that his captors had blindfolded him and moved him around the region several times over the past few months. Understandably, he was fragile and hungry when he appeared largely unscathed except for the missing ear. The incident left horrible mental and emotional scars. The police did track down his kidnappers. To catch Paul's kidnappers, a former U.S. intelligence agent named Fletcher Chase was put in charge of handing over the bags of money, which the police had microfilmed. Chase drove near Naples when the captors pulled up next to him. As he was giving them the ransom, a detective and police officer posing as tourists got a good look at the gang. Upon returning to Rome, they were able to identify the criminals and trail them for about a month before they arrested them. Paul returned to Italy to physically identify the captors. While a total of nine were arrested, just two were convicted and sent to prison. Now, after his release, he turned to drugs and alcohol in about a year. When he was 18, he married a German photographer named Gilsa Zakhar, who was 24. He really tried to get his life together and attended a Pepperdine University for one semester. He also had two children, a stepdaughter named Anna and a son named Balzazar, who became a famous actor. He kept struggling in the aftermath, so he moved his family to New York for a while where he hung out with Andy Warhol and other artists, and before long, he was really heavy abusing drugs and alcohol. Okay, when Granddaddy died in 1976, Paul got nothing. His father only received $500. The family patriarch donated most of his fortune to charities and nonprofit organizations such as the Getty Museum. While he stiffed many of his male family members, he was generous with the women in his life. He included 11 women in his will giving an ex-wife $55,000 a year for life and leaving an art dealer, a London widow, and a decorator each massive chunks of Getty stock. In 1981, 
Paul overdosed after taking Valium, methadone, and alcohol. The effects were devastating for the young man. He had a stroke and became a quadriplegic. He couldn't speak, and he was nearly blind. His mother took care of him, but it wasn't enough. Desperate and in financial straits, he sued his father for 28000 a month to help pay for his medical necessities. He died in 2011 at the age of 54. There was a movie made about his life in 2007, and I'd like to see this. It's called All the Money in the World. It was released Christmas Day, and Christopher Plummer played the role of J. Paul Geddes I. The film was based on John Clemens' 1995 book, Painfully Rich. Following the movie release, Michael Mamatilli, the nephew of one of Paul's kidnappers, spoke out against the film, claiming it was inaccurate, that the teen was not solely the victim. He told Variety that Paul was in on it the whole time. He said the kid planned his own kidnapping. It started off with great intentions. It was a quick way to make a buck on both sides. It turned into a mess because of the grandpa not wanting to pay. I found this story very, very sad that you can have all the money in the world and you can still be miserable. J. Paul I made all this money. He was miserable. His son apparently was miserable. And this grandson was also died very early in his life. 54 was, or 56, whichever he was, was very, very young, passed away, and yeah. to live the life that they did. And, and the money got them nowhere. It did benefit some charities and some other things, but it didn't help this family. Now, let me say this, and I told Gary that I did a little digging, and one of J. Paul's other granddaughters married Elizabeth Taylor's son, and they divorced and she developed AIDS, HIV, but it was from drug abuse. Yeah, what a fascinating story, Jesus Boom. Thanks for that, and thanks for doing the research on it. So a couple of takeaways here, and you kind of hit on one pretty obviously, is that misery begets misery, doesn't it? Sure does. And being this uh, very rich, oil, barren type of personality, and just look at look at what was going on there. It was that was incredible. And how dangerous are people like that? I mean, they clearly are only interested in the business aspects of even their own family. Ah, I, that just astounded me. Yeah. That he negotiated them down so he could claim it as a tax deduction. Right. Then charged his son four percent interest to borrow the rest. Frumpy has been listening pretty closely, and thanks. He asks if we think that he planned his own kidnapping. A couple of things, let's analyze it a little bit. One that, you know, obviously, I think you said, Gigi's boo, that it was part of the Italian mafia that, mm. was, that was involved in the kidnapping, right? Right, and I don't believe that. Yeah. Uh, the mob's going to knock you off if they don't get what they want. That that's Well, that may be a good point to support the idea that maybe it was prearranged. And also, the presence of John Paul Jr. living in Italy makes you wonder if maybe he was somehow associated with the Italian Mafia. I don't think that anything much of any great value or any high-level concern of operation isn't somehow associated with the Italian Mafia, whether they like it or not. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Whether they like it or not. So it would be reasonable to suspect that perhaps there was some mafia involvement and perhaps based on what you described as John Paul Getty's stingy nature, these family members <laughs> knew that they probably weren't going to inherit much of anything. So perhaps it was a setup deal to start with, with the idea. Yeah, and, and I think it's very sad. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but if you look at, the old man, he made all the money. Like I said, he was tight. Did he really love? Did he know what love was? He knew what the love of money was. And to treat a kidnapping or his family, the child that died young with a brain tumor, 
He didn't bother to go to his funeral. That tells me he didn't care anything about his family. Although he loved women now. That's evident. You know, he left the women the most money, but psychiatric nursing and me coming out. Maybe he saw in the sons himself, not as go-getters, but he could see himself and what he could have become if he not had worked the way he did. Maybe. But there was no mention of the recovery of any of the money, was there? No. Mm-mm. So we don't know what happened to that those millions of dollars that were Mm-mm. paid out. Mm-mm. Well, which I think is also something important to bear in mind. So we don't know that there may have been a sharing of the assets, if you will, from the kidnapping. So it's there's probably a whole lot more to the story. And I actually suspect that the one kidnapper's son, relative, whatever, that was critical of the movie, I would not dismiss that out of hand. There may have been a whole lot more to this than met the eye. And you can imagine... Once you go out on that limb, and if the old man bucks up and says he's not going to pay, well, guess what? If you were the one who, with your associates, orchestrated this whole thing, well, your associates may get pissed off because they look like they may be, have gone out on a limb for nothing, mm-hmm. and which could account for a missing ear, but not killing the kid, right? That's right. Just send them a little surprise, just a little surprise. Yeah. I sure. looked at pictures of him after they had taken his ear off, and it looks like, although he had the ear removed, it looks like there might have been some cosmetic surgery done on that right ear. It was the right ear that was removed. Right. And from what I can see on pictures, the right ear doesn't look as bad as what it did right after he was released. So I guess the question is, would you give your right ear for $2.2 million? Not me. <laughs> I don't know. But you mentioned the fact that they were redheaded, but you also have come across a really interesting story about redheaded people having some really strange superpowers. You want to get into that? Yeah, it really was an eye-opener to me because I do have a lot of red highlights in my hair. And that's why I've always been really able, if I wanted to change my hair color, to go to a chestnut red because it really grabs it. Natural redheads do have a soul. And I thought that was so funny when the man said that. He said, while theirs is the rarest of all hair colors, redheads still make up a significant portion of the world's population. Sometimes, though, people with ginger and auburn hair struggle. Through the years, they've been ostracized in society as saying um, crazy myths have sprung up about them. We even had a doctor that used to say, you know how Red had got her hair, came in pissed in, in his wife's ear, and it rusted her brain. But it's down and out, red hair is something. They could be considered genetic superheroes because their bodies are incredibly resilient. Now, while they're not as extreme as X-Men, people with red locks deal with more than their fair share of genetic mutations. The altered genes gives them a different DNA and host of other unique abilities and awe-inspiring. They have a higher pain threshold variety of studies investigated whether people with red hair experience pain differently and the results suggested that redheads may be less susceptible to most types of pain. A McGill University study found that redheads could handle more electric shocks than those with different color hair. Other research discovers that gingers are better at handling stabbing or sharp pain. A university professor, Lars Ardett Nielsen, noted Our tests show that redheads are less sensitive to these particular types of pain. They react less to pressure close to the injected area or to a pinprick. They seem to be better protected, and I find that extremely interesting. The vast majority of people get vitamin D when they're exposed to sunlight. The body converts the ultraviolet rays into essential materials. 
Redheads are more easily damaged by ultraviolet light, and they don't always live in especially sunny areas. But guess what? Their bodies develop a unique adaption to compact these things. Even under very low light conditions, redheads can easily get enough vitamin D. Their bodies produce it naturally without the need of ultraviolet light. Now, you always heard that most redheads come from the Irish. That's not so. And they're not all Caucasian. People from all races have ginger locks. It's more common in areas such as northern Europe and specific parts of Russia. However, the genetic mutation has also spread throughout parts of South America, Asia, Afra, Morocco. Morocco, for example, has a higher than normal population of redheads. Here's a real go-getter for you. They tend to smell better. People believe that redheads had a different and more attractive smell since the late 1800s. And many writers go into detail about how those with red hair give off a naturally pleasing scent. Some even suggest their pleasant odors act as aphrodisiacs, making redheads more attractive to the opposite sex. And indeed, their skin is more acidic than usual. The high acid levels break down fragrances differently, producing stronger aromas. Anesthesiologists long believed that redheads required more anesthesia than other people. The belief was so widespread that research was carried out in 202 to find a definitive answer. Medical professionals wanted to ensure that patients received the right amount of anesthesia as too much or too little could be very dangerous. The study compared redheaded women to brunettes by administering common anesthetics and then exposing both the tests and control groups to electrical shocks. In the end, the redheads needed about 20% more anesthesia than the brunettes. Now, this is going to make a lot of you men folks smile. According to German intercourse researcher Dr. Werner Habermill, women with red hair are more intimately active than those with blonde or brunette hair. The professor explained, the sex lives of women with red hair were clearly more active than those with other hair color, with more partners and having sex more often than the average. The figures reveal that typically redheads have intercourse at least one more time per week than the rest of the population. They are aggressively impacted by the temperature. The genetic differences that give redhead their unique hair color makes them far more sensitive to changes in temperature. Scientists believe that the MC1R gene may also affect the gene responsible for detecting temperature, making natural gingers feel much colder when the temperature drops. For the same reason, they're more susceptible to burning when it's hot outside. They have a lower pigment levels, so they're more likely to get skin cancer. Individuals with naturally red hair are more susceptible to damage from ultraviolet light. Redheads typically carry genes that give them fair skin, so they produce more of the melanin pigment. And it's far less effective at protecting the skin from ultraviolet light. Unfortunately, this leaves redheads with a higher chance of developing skin cancer, as ultraviolet light is more likely to damage the skin. They don't make up a large part of the population, although it's difficult to accurately estimate the exact number of redheads on the planet. Statistic models and small-scale studies do give researchers a general idea. Many other researchers agree that people with red hair form 1% or 2% of the population. That's about 70 to 140 million people. And the vast majority live in Europe and North America. And they make up about 10% of the population 
in Scotland and Ireland. I found that very, very odd since you hear all the Irish jokes of the redhead. Now, they all have the same genetic mutation, although red hair comes in a variety of different shades. The colors are caused by the same thing. People will only be redheaded if they receive two copies of a recessive allele that causes the MC1R gene to mutate. This protein is found on chromosome 16, and it's responsible for producing melanin. The altered version of the gene produces much more than normal, causing the fiery red hair. They might only have ginger facial hair. Now, my father does. If he grows a beard, he's redheaded, but his hair is brown on top. The MC1R gene mutation expresses itself in several different ways. This is why some people have ginger beards and dark hair when only half of the MC1R gene is mutated. Red hair tends to pop up in places other than the top of the head. A Dutch genetic said the same genes can express themselves differently for anyone. That allows for lots of possibilities, one of which is that the color of your head hair differs from the color of your armpit, pubes, or beard. They've had to do a lot of overcoming negative stigmas. Redheads were often persecuted because of their locks. Many cultures considered natural gingers to be unlucky or evil. Some redheads were even called witches during the Middle Ages. Redheads have also developed reputations for being fiery and bad-tempered. However, there is no evidence to support that. A more recent myth suggests that redheads are in danger of going extinct. But no scientific proof accredits this claim. In fact, the recessive genes that cause ginger hair are able to skip multiple generations, so it's incredibly unlikely that the trait will die out. In my family, I had a red-headed Irish grandmother, and through her, I think that's how we're getting all the, the red highlights and Maybe a little bit of blonde highlights in our hair, but most of us have the red, and that can come in on the Native American side, too. But I found that very, very, very interesting. It's funny how you can research these things and then find out something that you didn't even know. I didn't know that. None of it. Yeah, and even most recently, in fact, I just tripped over an article this week that some of the latest genetic studies suggest that the origin of red hair was with the Neanderthals. So that would actually, when you think about that, and, you know, the environments that the Neanderthals probably existed in prior to their extinction, or assimilation perhaps might be a better way to describe it, might be consistent with some of the characteristics that you described that people with red hair have. And also, socially, from a sociological perspective, might help account for some of the uh, biases that were expressed against red-headed people. So what do you think about that, Gigi's Boo? Mm-hmm. I think you're right. <laughs> Probably says, I thought she was saying redheads were more likely to give you the green light. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well... Well, it, ap it appears that they are very ready. Yeah, if the time is right and the situation is right, yeah, that could be the case. That's it. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks so much. for You did a lot of work on both of those topics and, and did an outstanding job with it. And let's, My tongue was tied a little bit tonight, uh, and I'm sorry. Hey, but I had some dental work done, and my mouth is still sore. So my tongue trips over itself, so y'all excuse me. Yeah, well, yeah. tongue's tied and you couldn't see what you were saying. That's, that's, that's right. That's, what we're, that's all right. It happens to all of us. And as we move along here, let's change gears and switch into a slightly different evaluation of what strange things that people do for money and what strange things that people who perhaps feel themselves to be separate and apart and better than other people might be involved in. There's a story here that's been going on actually for some time. It happened in Malta, and it happened back in 20, 
2016, actually, in July of 2016, seems this German teenager was found dead at the foot of the Dingley Cliffs in Malta in July of 2016. And it turns out <laughs> that all of his all of his organs had been removed, including the small intestine, the stomach, the bladder, the right kidney, adrenal glands, pancreas, liver, lungs, neck organs, brain, and heart. It was all missing. That sounds like a, an unbelievable fate for someone, but apparently it's more common than most Americans realize. He's 17 years old, and he arrived on holiday on July 8th and was found dead on July 26th. And we're not going to go through all of this, but he was found at the base of a cliff. But as it turned out in a subsequent article, which just recently <laughs> brings it up again, that it is still under investigation without any closure. Okay, that is just an incredible thing. It makes you wonder what's going on here. What's going on with such an egregious event as this, but there's no closure on it? And we're talking about Malta, if you did not catch that the first time. And as it turns out, Malta officials tried to say that it was animal effects that caused all the organs to go away and the brain had dissolved and liquefied all this stuff. But the German forensic team found that his body had not been embalmed, even though the Maltese forensic team stated that it had. Also, they contradicted the whole idea of animals and brains dissolving, saying that, that was, there was no evidence of that, and it was highly unlikely that, that that was the case. So there's a whole lot going on in the background here, and perhaps this might have something to do with it. January 8th of this year, the Washington Post issued an article talking about a cruel harvest of the poor Israeli allegedly behind human organ black market arrested in Cyprus, which is only a two-hour flight away from Malta, both in the, in the Mediterranean. A Turkish man named Yilmaz Altun crashed on the floor of an airport in Pristina, the capital of Kosovo. He'd been waiting for a flight home when he collapsed. When they checked him, they discovered a large, fresh wound snaking down his abdomen. His left kidney was gone. Ooh, dear God. The young man's collapse was the first domino to go into a complex investigation into an international organ black market operating out of the Balkan country. The spite mostly from Turkey and the former Soviet Union provided desperate donors from Turkey and the former Soviet Union provided the organs. Buyers, many from Israel, paid between 80,000 and 100,000 euros for the kidneys. International prosecutors would later determine that at least 23 people had their organs removed at one particular area in Kosovo in an eight-month run in 2008. And goes on to describe some of the reasons behind it. On Friday, authorities in Pristina, the capital of Kosovo, announced Moshe Harrell, an Israeli national, had been arrested in Cyprus. Reuters reported him having been accused of being the fixer who found donors. Harrell has been wanted, rather, by Interpol since 2010 on charges of human trafficking and intentional infliction of grave injuries. He's also wanted on a warrant for the same crimes in Russia. So it seems like a pretty good case on this guy, right? But as it turns out, for some whatever reason, the court, let me go ahead and scroll down to this next article that talks about it. The, the court annulled all the convictions of the people involved at the clinic that was this all was all going on at. And after having these people haven't been uh, Convicted, the court turns around and annuls the whole thing. And we're talking years. This is going, this is now continuing in process. Okay, it's gone back to court again. Separately in 2010, a Council of Europe envoy accused Kosovo Albanian guerrilla fighters of harvesting organs from captives, most of them Serbs, during the Kosovo War. Bottom line here, this is a very prevalent uh, operation overseas. And if it's overseas, I would tend to believe it probably happens here as well. So some of these missing people that are never found, eh, what do you think? And this kid in Malta, he was found at the base of the cliff, and 
The forensic team determined that his cause of death was not from a fall. So what does this sound like? It sounds like... He was hacked up and thrown off the side of the mountain. Right. And, and the most gruesome thing about this is, for all you organ donors out there, you are alive when they take your organs. Right, G.D. Booth? Exactly. They'll tell you there's no brain activity, but I don't believe that. Yeah. So you're alive when they take these organs one way or another. If it's in a not-so-pleasant environment, you can imagine what's going on here. So these are the kinds of monsters that you're up against. And we talked about, Brenna rather, talked about the John Paul Gettys of the world and how basically you're talking about psychopathic mindsets that don't care about family. They only care about whatever they consider their success to be. And at the same time, we have five minutes to go, Gigi's boo. At the same time, we look at what's going on with population control. We've alluded to this in the past. There are lot, there's lots of evidence there's, there, that there's an ongoing process of not only harvesting people and harvesting their assets and maybe even harvesting their organs, but at the same time, a slow kill reduction of population where they can harvest you through your medical payments, through taking care of you. We're going, we'll, we'll make you all better just so we can take your money and your assets. And that's one of the interesting things about, you know, people who go on Medicaid. What about that, Jesus? But what happens to your property if, if after you die and you've been on Medicaid? Oh, the state comes takes it. Mm-hmm. So, and uh, you are not likely to get the better care in a hospital if you're on Medicaid is those who are on private insurance. Okay, so they could kind of speed up the seizure of your assets by not mm-hmm. giving you the greatest care in the world, right? That's hmm. right. Hmm. What an interesting, you know, I mean, all, I'm sure that all you coincidence theorists out there say, wow, that's all coincidental. Then you have the articles that we've talked about in the past that have discussed back in 2017 that half the world's population has reached below replacement fertility so I don't know what's behind all that. <laughs> Something's going on. And then you have the Breitbart articles that we've talked about back in December 2017 that the soaring overdose deaths are cutting the U.S. life expectancy for the second year. Is that what it is or is it something else? And then you have this whole concept of the Codenhove Kalergi plan, which outlined the genocide of the people of Europe. And this has been going on for a very long time. talks about the mass migration as being causes of which are cleverly concealed by political elites and the multicultural propaganda employed to falsely portray it as inevitable. And with this article, they attempt to prove once and for all that mass immigration is not a spontaneous phenomenon, but rather something of a more dire plan. The Kalergi plan, as it's called, and you can check all this out. In the links later on in the blogcaster, the facilitation of genocide is also the basis of the constant appeals from the United Nations demanding that we accept billions of immigrants to help counter the low birth rate, to help counter the low birth rate among Europeans, according to a report published in January 2000 by the Population Division of the United Nations in New York. And it goes on to say that Europe will need to accept 159 million migrants by 2025. Interesting date, 2025. We've talked about the Deagle report that suggests, that or predicts rather, a decrease in the global population of about 3 billion people and of the United States population of about 85%. And they attribute a lot of that in their notes to migration. Although I don't think... Three billion people migrated off the planet. <laughs> so, I don't know about all that. Dwindling sperm count has impacts beyond male fertility. This very recent article, just this week. And speaking on Sunday at the end of 2018, the Endocrine Society's 100th annual meeting in Chicago, endocrinologists from Italy explained their observations in a new study on the link between semen quality, reproductive function, and metabolic risks. It says infertile men are likely to have important coexisting health problems or risk factors that can impair quality of life and shorten their lives. 
good article. I recommend you check it out in the blogcaster. Bearing in mind the 5G that we talked about earlier. And last but not least, and we're going to head on out of here, is this very comprehensive resourced articles about the history of the population control movement from 1798 to 1998. So if you have any doubts that there hasn't been and continues to be an agenda to cull you, and by the way, profit off you in the process, then I think you need to check this out. It goes beyond coincidence. Anyway, thanks to Gigi's Boo for all her outstanding work tonight. Thanks to all the folks listening out there. And Gigi's Boo, what you got to say? Uh, That's what I'll always say. Be sure to take the road less traveled. It's a lot more fun. And I love you big to my heart. Have a safe week. Yes, ma'am. Yes, hello, everybody out there at the road less traveled. Thanks for listening, and we'll catch up with you next time at reallibertymedia.com, RLM Radio, and don't forget about freedomsnetwork.com if you feel so inclined. Take care. Have a wonderful week. Bye-bye.